The following interview was conducted with Willie Reed, Dean of the School of Veterinary Medicine at Purdue University. On Friday, it took place on Friday, October 3, 2008, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Well, Catherine, I was born in uh, Mobile, Alabama. Uh, that's in the southern part of the state. Uh, uh, my parents and I uh, um, moved from Mobile, Alabama when I was a small child up to my, my father's home, actually, a little town called McIntosh, uh, Alabama. Uh, my mother's still still there. My father died a few years ago. Uh-huh. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I have uh, three younger sisters. Okay. Tell us a little about early years and then a little bit going on to high school. What was early early schooling and what was high school like? The early my early years uh were uh, they were there were periods there when it was difficult and painful. I ex I grew up during uh, uh the time of desegregation in the South. Uh, time when it was difficult for uh, children to go to school, uh, and I was caught in the middle of that. Um, I can recall uh, when I was uh, six years old, I was starting school. I remember being so excited to start uh, school. My grandmother had taught school for many years, and so she taught me at home, and she instilled an, an uh, mm -hmm. excitement about education. So I was anxious to go to school, and I remember. Uh, going to school and uh, every, for about a week and I was excited to go each day and then all of a sudden it just stopped uh, and I wondered you know why am I not going to school uh, and then that the rest of that year my, my grandmother actually taught me first grade because uh -huh. uh, later I would learn it was because of the, there were protests and uh, I couldn't go to school because there was my, my parents were fearful that I would be injured uh, during this time of, of unrest and then the following year, my grandmother and I had to move to another town about 50 miles ago, uh, away so that I could uh, go to school. And I would leave every Sunday night with my grandmother, and uh, we would go to this new town uh, so that I could go to an all-black school because the school that was being desegregated uh, was resisting it, and so I couldn't go. And I did that for nine years. So for nine years of my life, I... I commuted, I, huh? I commuted, and I, I, I remember how awful that felt because I didn't get a chance to see my parents after school. And so that was a very painful time uh, for me. Uh, although when I uh, was in ninth grade, uh, things had settled down. I was able to come back home and go to the local high school and uh, enjoyed that very much. But I feel like uh, a lot of my uh, right. Childhood was uh, cheated because yeah. of, of that, but it was just a difficult time growing up uh, in the South doing in the late 50s and and 60s during a period uh, of desegregation. Sure. Were there any activities in high school that you participated in? Well, I I enjoyed uh, band. I played in the marching band. In fact, I started playing uh, uh, when I was in this third grade. Uh, it was a small uh, school with. Uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school all together. So as an elementary kid, I was I was in the marching band with middle schoolers and high schoolers. <laughs> and so I played alto sax for... for uh, you got moved up quickly. I got moved up quickly, <laughs> and uh, so that was fun. And then eventually, when I got uh, older, and, and I think 10th grade, I started to play football and enjoyed that very much and uh, did very well in, in, yeah. in that. What position did you play? I played uh, on offense, I uh, played uh, center, and on defense I played uh, middle linebacker. Good. So it was a lot of fun, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and also I was very active in the FFA, the Future Farmers of America, and, and that helped solidify my interest in uh, veterinary medicine. Right, okay. And then after high school, what was new? What about college? Can you tell us about Well, that? in college, uh, you know, when I was growing up, my father uh, had a fascination with veterinary medicine. And I think it was something that probably he wanted to pursue, but couldn't because of the era in which he grew up. Um, so he kept uh, pushing me towards veterinary medicine. Then I had a wonderful teacher in high school. Um, my vocational agricultural teacher uh, pushed me towards veterinary medicine. And I had always, well, I had a deep interest in science and mathematics. And so it was a natural fit. Sure. And I, medicine was something that I wanted to do. And I didn't really want to do human medicine. So I uh, went off to, uh, to, to college uh, at that time. Um, there was only two possibilities of veterinary school for me. 
uh, in Alabama, that was Tuskegee University and, and Auburn University. And Auburn at that time, to my knowledge, had never accepted uh, an African American into their veterinary school. And so I chose to uh, enter Tuskegee University, uh, a historically black institution, mm -hmm. and uh, into pre in pre-vet and uh, did my undergraduate work and then was admitted to veterinary school uh, at Tuskegee and uh, completed that in 1978. Okay. Tell us a little about campus. Did you live on campus or what was Yes, I, I lived on campus um, all the years except one. Um, the year, the summer between my third and fourth year in veterinary school, uh, I was married. I uh, met my wife at Tuskegee and we were married that summer and that final year we, we lived off campus. Sure, okay. Were there, uh, how about the athletics when you were in school? Did you continue with that? I did not continue with athletics in, okay. in, in college. I, I enjoyed watching it but I did not participate. Yeah, yeah. okay. Any other student activities that uh, we Something that maybe along the vet line at all? Yes, I, I, was, um, I was very active in the, it's called the student chapter of the American Veterinary Medical Association. So I got involved with that. And that was my, a good start. In my fourth year, I became president of the, that student organization. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed it. You got a lot of camaraderie and things of that sort. Yes, I, had, I enjoyed working with, uh, it, it, with students, with my, my, my fellow students, and it allowed me to. I uh, get to know students in years one, two, three, and four. Right. Uh, so that was fun. And yeah. I also it allowed me to work with uh, some of the faculty and staff uh, at a different level. So sure. I very much enjoyed that. Good. After you got your uh, DVM, then tell us a little bit about uh, what went well, on. Well, when I was uh, second year in veterinary school, uh, I discovered pathology. And it was it was very interesting to me, and I thought, well, this is maybe this is something that I would want to do because I was already beginning to uh, feel that I I didn't want to uh, pursue clinical practice. Uh, most veterinary students come to school thinking that they will finish and and go into clinical practice, either work for someone as an associate or start their own veterinary practice. But the second year, I, I started to think, well, I'm not sure I want to do that. And then I discovered pathology, and that was fascinating. And so the su two summers uh, while in vet school, I pursued different kinds of pathology uh, experiences. And the summer that I got married, uh, I spent uh, that summer in Kalamazoo, Michigan, working for, um, at the time, it was called the, the Upjohn Company. It later became Pfizer. Um, Pfizer purchased them sometime in the, uh, the 90s. Um, and I met um, a Purdue graduate. Uh, who, who had, gone, for the who had gone through the pathology training program. He'd actually gone to Tuskegee University a, as well. And he had come here to do his PhD in pathology. And when he found out that I was interested in pathology, uh, of course he said there was no other place uh, to study pathology but, uh, but Purdue because he felt like he had the best training in the world, as he would put it. And so I remember um, that uh, he introduced me to uh, some professors here at Purdue. And on my way back to Alabama that summer, I stopped in and uh, visited the campus and uh, met people in the vet school and decided, uh, yeah, this, I think I want to go to Purdue. And I went back and completed my application and uh, submitted it, and uh, I was accepted. And so uh, two weeks after graduating from vet school, I was here on Purdue's campus pursuing a PhD in pathology. Very good. Okay, what year now would that have been? This, this was 1978. Okay, and what was campus like? To tell us a little bit, and where were you living when you got here? And tell us a little about that. Well, when yeah. I got to campus, I lived uh, I lived uh, uh, in, in campus housing, married student housing. I lived at 14211 Halsey Drive. I still remember the address. It's over <laughs> near the airport. <laughs> right. And we lived there for. Uh, um, uh, almost four years. Uh, the, the last year we moved uh, to Arnold Drive but so that we could um, uh, have a two-bedroom apartment because by that time our daughter was born okay. and we needed a little more room. Sure. And, um, and as I finished my, as I was finishing my, my PhD here, I was approached by um, um, the department head uh, in, in the department in which I was in and also the director of the Di Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here about the possibility of staying on the faculty. And 
I never thought I would stay here, and I never thought they would want me to stay. Uh, and I thought about it after interviewing at uh, probably five or six places throughout the country, and I was offered jobs sure. everywhere I went. So I, I had I had a lot of opportunities, and so and I hard choices and hard too. choices. And I thought about uh, I thought about my 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 short term and my long term goals. And as you finish, when you finish a, a pathology training program, the next step is to become board certified in, in pathology. And I, I knew it was very important for, for me to become uh, board certified. And I thought, well, where, where could I accomplish that the best? Because it takes a lot of study. It takes about a year's, year's uh, worth of study. And you need to have access to materials and you need people to help you. And I thought, well, I think I can accomplish that best here at, at Purdue, and I certainly uh, had a wonderful relationship with the faculty and everyone, and I thought, well, Purdue is a place that I, that I think mm -hmm. I could be happy at, and so I accepted uh, the position, and, and I worked here on the faculty for eight years. Okay. Who was the dean w uh, when you were here? Was that the dean was Jack Stockton. Okay. okay. Uh, Jack Stockton, was, uh, he was a very nice man, I thought a very good dean, and also B Billy Hooper uh, was the associate dean. And, and they both were very uh, encouraging, uh, and that contributed uh, uh, to my decision. And in the department, uh, Dr. Robert Claflin uh, was very uh, kind to me and helped me uh, a lot. And the director of the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory at that time, um, Dr. Farrell Robinson, and then later Dr. Leon Thacker. Um, so I had a lot of support right. and. Uh, I said, well, why leave this to go to go to some other place and there were so many unknowns. Right. Sound worked out very well. It worked out very well. Right. And then you, but you did leave. So but I did, I did leave. Right. I did leave and that was, um, at the time, I thought it was, uh, when I had the opportunity to leave, I felt that it was the most difficult decision I had ever made in my life. Um, and in fact, I, I remember uh, my wife and I going back and forth, going back and forth on that. And then finally, uh, did they did, come to you? Yes, yeah. they did. Okay. They did. Uh, okay. After a lot of uh, prodding and prodding, I finally applied. And, uh, and then they called and asked if I would, you know, come and, and, and formally interview. And and I thought, well, okay, I'll do it. It's you know, at the very least, I would learn something from the process. Sure. And uh, I, I went to East Lansing and I interviewed at Michigan State and a few weeks later uh, I got a phone call from their dean saying he'd like to bring me to East Lansing. <laughs> and so we, my wife and I uh, looked, uh, certainly considered that uh, almost every day. We went back and forth with the pros and the cons and, and finally we decided, no, we're going to stay at Purdue. And I thought my decision was made, and then I received a call, another call from a, a friend that I had at Michigan State, and um, and then I talked to uh, trusted advisors here, and they convinced me that this was a real, this was a great opportunity, one that probably I should uh, consider very, very carefully because uh, sometimes uh, when an opportunity comes, it may not come at the time you want it to come, and it may not come around again so mm -hmm. soon. And uh, I thought through that, and I thought, well, maybe they're right. And at that time, we had been here all together 12 years. Wow. And I thought, That's and quite a period of time. That's quite a period of time. Sure. And, and then my, um, my kids were little. Uh, at the time, my daughter was nine and my son was five. And I thought, well, if I'm going to move, it's probably a good time to, to move. And we did. And I spent uh, 16 excellent years at, at, at Michigan State and and because of those years uh, at Michigan State I was presented with this opportunity to come back to Purdue as as Dean. Yeah. Tell us at Michigan State you had a there was a special position that you had there just for the researchers what you're yeah. doing there. Well you at Michigan it. State I was recruited there to uh, at the first job I had was to direct their their diagnostic laboratory. It was one of the largest veterinary diagnostic labs in the country highly respected, so it truly was a, a good good opportunity. And during the course of my 16 years, I we, that laboratory grew by leaps and bounds, and uh, the 12th year I was there, I had a chance to uh, help uh, acquire uh, $58 million to build this wonderful, wonderful new uh, facility uh, that was... Uh, what an opportunity. That is the envy of all veterinary diagnostic laboratories in the country. 
And at the same time, uh, uh, for eight years there, I was head of the uh, path, path, it's called the pathobiology department. So I was really doing two major jobs. I was a department head and directing uh, the veterinary diagnostic laboratory, which is it's about the, twice the size of the, the animal disease diagnostic sure. laboratory here on campus. We had 120 uh, faculty and staff in this laboratory, about a $10 million uh, budget, and we serve the veterinary, the veterinary diagnostic needs of owners and veterinarians throughout the country. We had clients in every state in the U.S. Wow. And, and Canada and other foreign countries. That sounds so, like a big operation. So it was a huge operation. I learned uh, many business skills, management skills, and dealing with personnel. It was a valuable experience. And at the same time, I was able to continue my, my research career, and I, I trained uh, a number of graduate students uh, in pathology, and uh, they are now scattered all over the, the country doing, doing a lot of good things. Yeah, that sounds good. Now, let's, now you come to Purdue, you're back at Purdue again. Tell us a little bit about, uh, I picked out a couple of departments just for the researchers. One is the, uh, your teaching hospital and the di diagnostic lab and also your oncology. I know there are others, but I thought the researchers are sort of right. unique. Yeah. Well, yeah, Purdue um, is really, is, has some what we would call signature areas, and these are areas that we've identified in our strategic plan. Um, Purdue has had a long history of doing wonderful research in the area of infectious diseases, particularly infectious diseases of swine. And when I was a graduate student, it, the pro program was really well known, booming. And in fact, my graduate work dealt with a swine disease. Mm -hmm. And so infectious disease is a, is a huge area in our school. Uh, more recently, though, oncology has merged as uh, an area where we have significant strengths. Uh, animals are living uh, much uh, longer. Uh, now and uh, more of them are developing uh, cancer. And we are taking advantage of the fact that uh, animals uh, many times provide good models uh, of human cancer, meaning that uh, we can do preclinical testing of drugs, compounds that are intended uh, perhaps for treating human cancer to see how they behave in, mm -hmm. in animals before we move to, to humans. We may find out that some are uh, just won't won't work, and so we can save a lot of valuable time uh, by finding that out in animals first. Because right. we 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 this work is directed uh, towards animals with naturally occurring cancer, so it means that we don't have to uh, produce cancer uh, in animals just for the sake of studying it. it we can help the animal at the same time uh, help humans as well. Right. Okay. And then. Uh, and then just actually just treating animals for the benefit of the animal. We have uh, radiation oncology, uh, we have uh, uh, chemotherapy, and all these things have been developed here, and we're very proud of that, that we just recently we hired our first veterinary radiation oncolog oncologist, and there are probably less than 60 of those in the world, board certified veterinary uh, uh, radiolo uh, uh, radiation biologists, and we have one now here at Purdue. Oh, very good, that's nice. Yeah. Now that you're on board, what are some of the challenges and your uh, priorities and things being the dean? Yeah. Well, the, what I have done the, f the, the first year that I, uh, that I um, was here, uh, we spent a lot of time developing a new strategic plan. When I arrived, the, the old plan was just about completed and it was time to, to redo it. And I, um, I started reviewing the history of the school again, and, and I discovered that uh, we were nearing a 50th year anniversary. So we've been spending a lot of time planning to celebrate that event in 2009, and we're going to celebrate it throughout the, the year. Many, many events are scheduled. Uh, so we're celebrating 50 years. Well, 50 years means uh, sometimes that you have maybe buildings, facilities that are 50 years old. So the challenge I have is replacing some of the physical structure. Uh, we need a new veterinary uh, large animal teaching hospital. The hospital that we have is 50 years old and it needs to be replaced. Many of our laboratories, research laboratories, our teaching labs, teaching classrooms are old and they need to be uh, updated. Uh, they were designed f uh, for a different era, for different kinds of research, different modes of teaching. Uh, things have changed a lot in 50 years. So we have, to, uh, we have to work on that, and that's going to be a big emphasis of my tenure as, as dean. 
Um, we're going to work a lot on um, diversity. Uh, the veterinary profession is not uh, very uh, diverse. Uh, for example, 95% of all veterinarians, clinical veterinarians practicing in the U.S. are white. Uh, whereas the minority population is around about 34 percent in the U.S. and it's, it's, it's growing and it's expected to uh, exceed 50 percent uh, probably about uh, 20, 2040. So we have to spend time on recruiting uh, young people from all, uh, all of, of society. We have to have uh, the veterinary uh, profession reflect society. Right. And so we're going to spend time um, uh, trying to recruit uh, uh, African Americans, Latinos, uh, Native American students to, to the profession. They need to hear about the wonderful opportunities that are available in veterinary medicine. And our country uh, needs them. Uh, we have a tremendous shortage right now of veterinarians in the U.S. In fact, uh, uh, we predict unless we expand enrollment at the 28 veterinary schools, that by 2020 we'll be short about 15,000 veterinarians. We only produce 2,700 veterinarians each year to serve a population of 300 million people, a population that is growing. The world population now is, uh, exceeds 6.5 billion people. Um, we need to be able to feed that population, and people expect uh, a lot of their uh, food to come from animals, uh, animal protein, and as more people around the world move from um, uh, poverty to middle class, uh, they want uh, animal protein uh, in their diets because uh, they can afford it. So to deal with uh, this changing world, uh, we have to uh, train more veterinarians, and then we have to prepare them to uh, function in now a global uh, economy. And so we're going to spend a lot of time in my tenure uh, exposing students to the rest of the world. Uh, we have the goal of um, providing all of our veterinary students with an international experience. We want them to, to develop intercultural competencies so that they can, they can navigate and function in this global economy. Yeah. What about you? Uh, the, are, is there more females going in the profession now yeah. than males? Is there, or is it, how, we have, the uh, profession has changed dramatically in the mm -hmm. last 25 yeah, and 30 that years. Um, about 80 percent of the veterinary students in the U.S. Uh, are female. It's female. And uh, at Purdue, we have 20, 25 percent of our entering class was made up of males this year. And actually that's an improvement, it was 20%. So we, we are working on that as well. We, we have a, a gender imbalance in veterinary medicine, and so we're trying to, to right that. And so we're reaching out, trying to encourage more males to consider veterinary medicine again. And we also have a, a problem with not enough veterinarians, veterinarians choosing to um, go into large animal, or to practice large animal medicine. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge uh, problem in the U.S. We have many underserved areas where people in rural areas just cannot uh, find a veterinarian to come to their farm to treat their, to treat mm. their animals. That's, a, and that's pretty hard. It, it's, 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 it's going to be, it could be a, um, a national security issue. You know, for example, uh, the introduction of um, foreign animal diseases that could devastate our uh, livestock populations. Uh, could happen uh, by terrorists or, or even uh, accidental introduction, and these diseases go in, uh, undetected for days, weeks, to the point where they become endemic and we, we can't eradicate them from the U.S., and that would close down our uh, export markets and, and really damage our uh, economy. Is there a reason why there there's not, doesn't, there's, there's does not seem to be an interest in, with all, well, certainly in Indiana, with well, all the Well, the, the, the demographics uh, oh. have changed uh, dramatically in, the, in our country. Um, we now have more, um, more people living in urban environments mm -hmm. than rural environments. So most of our students are coming from urban environments, so they don't have a background with uh, large animals or food animals. And so they come to vet school wanting to practice what they're familiar with, and that's what right. I practice centered around companion animals. 
Right. And, and so things have, have changed dramatically and we have to find ways to um, uh, entice more young people to go into uh, these rural areas and practice. And, and it's also very difficult to make a living, uh, living in a rural area and, and um, uh, having a veterinary practice where you uh, treat an individual animal. Uh, many times it's much cheaper to send a food animal to slaughter than to uh, pay a veterinarian to drive 30, 40 miles uh, for uh, a 10 minute treatment. Uh, the cost of that is just prohibitive. Right. Yeah. What about specialties? Are many of them are going into, are the students going into specialties? More that? of our students are going into, uh, are pursuing specialty training. About 30 percent of our students as well as 30 percent of uh, uh, veterinary students nationally enter into some sort of post uh, DVM, post doctor of veterinary medicine training, pursuing internships, uh, residency training, or graduate work. Uh, they're becoming oncologists, uh, surgeons, internal medicine specialists, radiologists, ophthalmologists. Uh, you name the specialty, our students are now pursuing those specialties, and uh, they're doing very well. Uh, an investment of three years post DVM to obtain specialty training um, puts you in a, a tier uh, that allows you to make uh, a really great income compared to uh, a starting general practitioner. Right, okay, that sounds, you, you have addressed a global uh, diversity. How, the enrollment, uh, about the applications, does that seem to be increasing or? Yes, we, we, we're, we're, we're happy here for doing that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in our program um, we receive uh, approximately 800 applications a year for 70 um, spots, 70 seats, and um, that's, that's good. It's been increasing the last uh, several years, and we were happy about that. Although many of those applicants are applying to multiple schools, so they are not all from Indiana. Mm. I want to make a comment for the researchers. There is no vet school in Kentucky, is that correct? There is no vet school uh, in Kentucky. And so uh, for the researchers who might ask, they can apply, they, what's yes. the arrangement they have with, yeah. to do with Well, Indiana? we don't have a specific, we do not have a specific arrangement with oh. any s state, um, but we do accept uh, out-of-state applicants, okay. uh, out-of-state students. Uh, in a class, we usually strive for about 25 to 35 uh, out-of-state students, so uh, that's really good compared to a lot of schools. Not many schools would accept that many out-of-state students. Sure. So uh, we we certainly have had uh, uh, Tuske uh, um, Kentucky and the surrounding states. Uh, the students from those states apply to our school. Now Kentucky, you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, has um, a contractual arrangement with Auburn University. I know, and so. Oh, okay. Uh, students can compete for those spots, uh, but they, you know, they certainly can apply to other schools as well. Sure, okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, fundraising and advancement. You yes. made some comments, but just a yeah. couple of points. Fundraising and advancement both are, are, are crucial today. Uh, as a dean, I spent a lot of time uh, in, those, in those areas. Um, it's actually a lot of fun because you meet uh, some interesting people who have a passion for, for animals and uh, they're looking for ways to uh, funnel that passion right. to, to helping them. And uh, I spend a good amount of time you know, with lunches and dinners and sure. meetings, visiting people. And, and we've had some wonderful gifts from uh, uh, usually clients of, of our veterinary teaching hospital. That speaks very well. Yes, and it's, it, it uh, is very uh, fulfilling and enjoyable to read uh, these wonderful notes that I get from grateful uh, clients. Uh, um, the people who work in our teaching hospital have a love for animals, and uh, that love comes through uh, all the time, it seems, and uh, people, the stories are just wonderful. They're a member of your family, right? Pet, Absolutely. Pet, pets are, are a member of the family. <laughs> right. That human-animal bond is um, closer now than ever before, <laughs> uh, certainly stronger now uh, than when I was in vet school, for example. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I agree. Um, how about the veterinary medicine in the 21st century? Make a couple comments on that. How, what changes you foresee or? 
Some I know you've yeah, some of the some changes that uh, one of the things I see that's happening um, is that um, veterinary medicine is is starting to go the way that uh, pharmacy uh, has gone over the years, where you find you don't find the um, um, the uh, small town pharmacists uh, or the pharmacist doesn't really own the the pharmacy practice. Uh, they work for large chains or corporations. Well, that's happening in veterinary medicine a as well um, because few veterinarians now, uh, uh, newly graduated veterinarians, can afford to um, start a veterinary practice. So they, they're taking jobs uh, working for um, large uh, hospitals, uh, sometimes uh, corporate uh, entities. And so I think veterinary medicine is slowly moving in, in, that, in that direction. Also, what is changing is is the fact that uh, uh, veterinary technicians are playing um, these are veterinary nurses are playing a bigger role in the in the profession. Uh, we see uh, the emergence of many new veterinary technology programs in the U.S. Um, in fact, there are now about 150 veterinary technology programs, whereas we only have 28 vet schools. And uh, even here in Indiana, I'm told that we have um, uh, f five programs. And ten years ago, uh, I think we only had one. That was at here at Purdue Didn't, University. Is the one at Purdue was the first one I, that, that was, was affiliated with a veterinary school. Yeah. In fact, there are only there are only there there are only two veterinary technology programs affiliated with vet schools. Uh, one here at Purdue and uh, Michigan State is the other school. Oh. So we it's feel rather unique. it's very unique, and and because of that affiliation, uh, we feel that uh, both schools uh, produce uh, very well trained um, uh, veterinary te technologists. Sure, right. Um, how about the campus? Has it changed since when you were here, and then when you came back? Any more well, more well, buildings? Well, it's right? interesting that uh, <laughs> you know there's some parts of the campus that look exactly the same. <laughs> Uh, but now then, the, uh, then the, the temporaries part, are gone. <laughs> right, and then there are parts that are, have changed uh, dramatically. Of course, you know, everybody talks about Discovery Park, and that's certainly a, sure. uh, something that's new and exciting and, and beautiful, beautiful buildings. The architecture over there is very nice. Um, and the campus, uh, you know, it seems to be a little bit more green space. and. Uh, the bell tower, of course, that was uh, constructed. That's a landmark. That's right. a landmark that uh, was constructed after I left, and that's a, a great addition to to the right. campus. The so, levee has changed since you. The, uh, the, the levee, I didn't recognize the levee. Uh, <laughs> that intersection of uh, River Road and, and State Road 26, uh, it, it looks like it looks nothing like I remember. Uh, You're looking for Sears, and it I'm wasn't there. I'm looking for Sears and Bruno's, you know, <laughs> right. in the corner. And of course, Sears is long gone, and uh, so yeah, it's a dramatic change in that part of the campus on that uh, west east side of campus. That's yeah. right. <laughs> oh, one of the awards that you got was that uh, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service Award. Tell us a little bit about that one that you received. Yeah, that the, that was a, a, a award that I'm very proud of. That uh, I, I was given by the administrator of the Animal Health and Plant Inspection Service, who at the time uh, happened to be a Purdue alumnus, Dr. Ron DeHaven. And it was a, it was a, a incredible honor to receive that because um, they, they usually only give it to about one person a year. And, and, and I don't know if they've ever given it, if they had, if they had ever given it to um, uh, a professor or a, a university type uh, a diagnostic laboratory director, uh, and so it was very fulfilling because of that. And it was to recognize me for my work in helping to establish something that's called the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. It's a network of veterinary diagnostic laboratories that, uh, that work with uh, federal laboratories to provide the uh, surveillance testing to protect uh, our animal interests uh, in the U.S. So it was. It was. It was, was there a, any advance in that notice or? No advance notice. Uh, the only <laughs> thing that I, you know, of course, you start looking back for. You, there were signs <laughs> if I had only seen them. And Others one, one obvious one was uh, uh, my wife uh, wanted to go to to go with me uh, to this meeting. Uh, it's called the AAVLD meeting, American Association of 
veterinary laboratory <laughs> diagnosticians meeting and she never goes uh, and then all of a sudden she wanted to know, well she wanted to know if she could go to this meeting. It was held in Minneapolis that year. And I said, well, yeah, I guess you can, you can go with me if you <laughs> want to go. And I should have known that something was, was up, but I had not. It wasn't, it wasn't to go to Miracle Wall. Wall. Right, it, it, it was, I had, but I had no clue. And uh, uh, the, the person who was setting up all this was uh, a woman by the name of Barbara Martin, works for USDA, and Barbara knows me well. And, um, and she knew my, my secretary at Michigan State, and so she worked with my, my, my beloved secretary, Janice Fuller. And Janice, and Janice gave her all the information and put her in contact with my wife. And so they, they, they completely uh, fooled it's me. It's great. It was great, yeah. <laughs> oh, let's talk about your family. Do you have, uh, you have a couple of children? Yes, I have, uh, I have a, uh, a daughter and a son, my, my, uh, my daughter Kimberly. Uh -huh. um, is um, a second grade school teacher. She's a literacy coordinator for her school. And Here, I, is she at Purdue? She, no, she works for the Arlington, Virginia school system. Yeah, she finished from, uh, she, her undergraduate work was at, uh, and her master's at Hampton University in Hampton, mm -hmm. Virginia. And then she did specialized training in literacy education at uh, Ohio State. And then my, my son, Brent. It's a Brent, good field. It's a good field. Right. She has lots of opportunities. She's, right. And she loves it. Um, my, uh, my son, Brandon, uh, graduated about a year and a half ago from Georgia Tech. And he's a mechanical engineer and now works for a company called CSX, a, a railroad transportation company. Oh, very good. Now lives in um, Chambersburg. Pennsylvania. Oh, sounds good. We don't play Georgia Tech, so you can have no, a rivalry. No, we don't play Georgia Tech. Right? <laughs> we haven't done. <laughs> that's we not just compete with them in the <laughs> rankings. <so. laughs> right. Other things, right? Other right, areas. Right, right. Oh, do you have a favorite tradition, Purdue tradition, that you'd like to share with us? One comes to mind. Well, the, I don't know if you could call it a tradition or not, but you know, I, you know, I was always, uh, I've always enjoyed watching the the band. And you know the world. That goes a little bit back in time, right? You know, back in time when I played <laughs> in the band, and sure. particularly you know the guys that roll around the the, the largest drum in the world, and to watch them bang on, on that thing was uh, it, it was always uh, exciting. And I used to take my son to watch that; oh, he liked sure. it too. So, so I, I guess that was something that I you know, fondly remembered about uh, about Purdue, and uh, well, the Grand Prix is also something that. Uh, uh, you know, always got my attention in the spring. Um, remember when they used to have the carnival with that? Yes, I do. I yeah. remember taking my... Well, your my fathers my, have taken their children. I used to take my kids over there every year. They would look forward to that. Now, I can remember it's all, it was in the spring, and, you know, in spring in Indiana, many times it's still very chilly and cold. <laughs> I can remember being over there with coats on. And right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's... Uh, so that those two things, yeah, I guess. Right. Yeah. How about an outstanding event? Got one of those that you'd like to share with us, or anything special? Um, well, probably the most outstanding Purdue event just happened uh, recently. It, it happened uh, uh, the first year that I was here. I, I remember when, um, well, when Sally Mason was still the um, the provost, uh -huh. and Martin Jischke was still president, and we had this uh, mosaic celebration. Uh, over in the Union. Mm -hmm. It was one of the most enjoyable events um, that I have ever attended and it was hard for me to believe that I was experiencing that event on this campus in Indiana. Uh, it was such a, a wonderful celebration of diversity right. uh, and people were happy and it was it was uh, quite the event and so uh, it'll be hard for some of the event to, to top that right. one. At least that was not. Yep. Yeah. Now, one, one thing, um, would you tell us about this um, Dolores McCall Pet Tribute Garden? This is something new at the school. Yes, the yeah. Tribute Garden the uh, is going to be yeah. named in honor of Dolores McCall. She's made a wonderful uh, donation. And it's, it's a place where you, people, individuals, can uh, have a tribute to their beloved pet. A place where they can uh, walk through and and uh, meditate and think about their pet and uh, is can they be there? Is it like a cemetery? Is it a, no? It's, it's only not a memorial. Only yeah. Okay. It, no, no, it's not a cemetery. Right. So it's a memorial garden. Memorial garden, and you know you can buy uh, a plaques to to your your name of your pet, 
or benches or things like sure. that uh, just to memorialize your, your pet. This yeah. is sort of unique it's a, uh, that you have Yeah, it's here. very it's very unique. Uh, we're very proud of it and uh, there's a lot of interest in it. Yes, I'm anxious to see it then. Any closing comments, uh, Dean Reed, that you'd like to share with us or the researchers that uh, come to mind? Anything special? Well, I'll, I, I would say the thing that I will probably, that I will end with is that uh, people um, often ask me why I would come back, why I came back to, uh, to Purdue. And what's unique here at Purdue, at least in the veterinary school, and that I remembered, and I was happy that it's still here, was that um, it feels like a family. Um, it really does. And I came back here because, not because of the, the buildings or things like that, but because of the people. Uh, they work hard, uh, they work well together, they care deeply about the school, and they care deeply about uh, helping uh, animals and advancing animal health and solving disease problems. And um, so, you know, that's the re those are the reasons I, I came back, and Purdue is a great place, and I'm, I feel very uh, privileged to, uh, at least for a time, uh, to serve as dean. Right. It's a great honor. All right. I thank you very much. And boiler off. Thank boiler you. Boiler off. Yes. This concludes the interview. Thank you very much. <laughs>